Jose Mourinho is heading to AS Roma, so we've decided to take on a bit of a time-traveling persona, calling himself Dr. Jit. We're going to jump into the future. We're going to see what a Mourinho-styled management of the side could result in. So yes, today's show, we're going to take a look at the tactical evolution of Jose Mourinho from his time at Chelsea, right, until Madrid. We'll talk about um, Tottenham Hotspur as well and see how his tactics may have changed and what this could possibly mean for AS Roma. So if you are keen to find out more, buckle up. It's time to jump into the future. Jose Marino is a renowned coach who has over the years shown that his style of football can change. Though his teams have generally been defined with a strong defense and a quick counter-attacking ethos, their approach has been different. What I'll attempt to do now is explain how his style has evolved and translate this to football manager. Jose Mourinho's title-winning sides have been built on a solid defense. Beating any Mourinho side at home was a big challenge. His title-winning Chelsea side would attack in a rigidly defined 4-3-3 and defend as a 4-5-1, with Claude McAlealy playing the role of a defensive midfielder protecting the back four. This at a time when most sides were playing a 4-4-2. The extra man in midfield made Chelsea hard to break down and almost impossible to beat after they had taken the lead. In general, his sides can either play out of defence or go long, a choice that depended on the quality of their goalkeeper. At Chelsea, Petr Cech wasn't comfortable on the ball, and in DDA Drogba, they had the perfect player to hold up any long ball played out from the back. The attacking patterns from long kicks would either allow Drogba to flick on for the inverted wingers in Damien Duff and Ian Robin, or allow Frank Lampard and DDA Drogba to create central overloads, creating more space to release balls into the channels. The forward would occupy both centre-backs if the ball was played to him. Lampard would have frequently arrive from midfield to receive it, providing a threat from outside the box or being an outlet for the wider inverted wingers. The fullbacks at Chelsea were very much attacking, but it was a pendulum attack. Whenever one fullback attacked down a flank, the other retained his defensive positioning. Protecting the back was Claude Mekalele, who was equally confident playing it short to the central midfielders or going long towards the target man. If Mekalele was shut out of the game, Frank Lampard would move into the half spaces to pick up the ball and carry the Chelsea attack further, encouraging either overloads on one side of the pitch or holding the ball up, allowing the inverted wingers to cut inside and do cutbacks. A key feature of Chelsea's attack was position swapping. In most games, both inverted wingers would swap positions midway through the game to vary the attacking patterns. This was a team that had clearly defined roles and duties. This is perhaps the most rigid of Mourinho's systems. In attack, Chelsea's patterns were interesting with both wingers playing inverted or releasing low crosses or cutbacks whenever necessary. McAlealy made that position his own a role that was so unique to him. Perhaps on Football Manager, the safest role to give a player like him would be a defensive midfielder. Michael Essien was a box-to-box -box midfielder and Frank Lampard a central attacking midfielder. Drogba was always playing off the shoulder of the last defender. He could receive the ball, hold it up for others and play in the wingers. And he could also turn the defenders and take them on. He was neither an advance forward nor a target man, he was both. So perhaps the role of a complete forward on attack would be the best for him. Both wide players in the Chelsea system were inverted wingers. By the time he got to Inter Milan, things were different. Here he had the twin strikers of Diego Milito and Samuel Eto'o, both devastatingly good in their prime. Inter Milan played a few formations during that season and varied depending on the opposition. When sides out to play narrow with three players in midfield, Mourinho would use a diamond midfield that could be achieved with various formations, a 4-3-1-2, a 4-4-2 diamond or a 4-2-3-1, all three being used at some point during the season. 
For the three central midfield positions, Mourinho used four different players, Esteban Cambiaso, Thiago Mota, Suleiman Tari and Dejan Stankovic. For the position of defensive midfielder, he rotated between Mota and Cambiaso, with Montari and Stankovic partnering in central midfield. Neither Mota nor Cambiaso were renowned for long-range passing. They mostly preferred to play short towards Wesley Schneider, and if that route was blocked out to Maicon on the right flank. Against stiffer competition, Mota or Cambiaso would play in central midfield with Montari on the bench. Whenever size lined up in a three-man midfield, the Portuguese would turn to the diamond. This was a formation he used with Inter Milan when they beat Chelsea. He used Eto and Balotelli in the win by getting both strikers to play in roles that moved into channels. In the Serie A, they sometimes shifted into a narrow diamond shape which was easy to do with the 4-3-1-2. Inter had two strong central defenders in the air and could afford to play narrow, allowing the opposition space down the flanks to deliver crosses which they counted easily. The narrow diamond played to Inter's strengths and the type of football that was prevalent in the Serie A. The diamond midfield would give them an extra man in the defensive and offensive thirds but came at the price of controlling the flanks. Mourinho tried to get more width out of the system with the use of Stankovic who was more of a Carrillo who drifted into the half spaces to support the fullback on the flanks. Maicon played as a marauding fullback down the right flank and was their main outlet for assists. If the midfield was overcrowded, the ball would shift to him. He was comfortable bringing it up and could dominate the flank with passing or crossing to find Wesley Schneider or the strikers. With 50 average passes per game, his was the highest in the team. Zanetti tended to hold his position as a fullback which meant that Eto needed to provide some width which he did by moving into the channels whenever the attacks went down the left flank. In the left central midfield position, Mourinho could also play Sulimantari, a player capable of operating in the half spaces to support play or cross with his left foot. He was more likely to play the ball towards Wesley Schneider who would in turn thread balls towards the strike pair. Wesley Schneider was given a largely free role in central attacking midfield to support attacking build-up. Most attacks would be focused through the middle. In FM terms, their midfield looked like it was anchored by a deep-line playmaker with a box-to-box -box midfielder on one side, a Carrillo or Mazzala on the other side, and an advanced playmaker. This created different attacking patterns due to the lack of support in the half spaces. Julio Cesar could direct his kicks towards the strike force of Eto and Milito. Wesley Schneider's central advanced attacking midfielder position allowed him to win the second ball as he supported the strikers. At Inter Milan, whenever Mourinho opted to play the ball out of the back, the ball was usually transitioned with shorter passes through the defensive holding midfielder and out to the fullbacks. To create vertical movement in attacks, one striker would attack the defensive line while another could hold up the ball for either the central attacking midfielder or back towards the central midfielders. Jose Mourinho's next title winning side, Real Madrid, lined up as a 4-2-3-1 in attack and a 4-4-1-1 in defence. Unlike his previous two teams, Real did not have a dedicated defensive midfielder. The team instead played with two pivots in midfield, the deep-line playmaker Javi Alonso and Sammy Hedera. Jabi would drop deep and offer himself up as a passing outlet, receiving passes from defence, and he could also play dangerous deep diagonals to the final third. Hedera was more of a deeper box-to-box -box player who would move up the pitch bringing the whole team with him. These two acted as pivots for Real, and whenever they were crowded out, the AMC would drop deep and offer himself out as a passing option. Real Madrid's midfield looked a lot more flamboyant with Jabi playing in FM terms as a deep-line playmaker. Sammy Hedera, a Segundo Volante, and Mesut Ozil as a Trequatista or even a roaming attacking central midfielder. Karim Benzema's strength in the air allowed for long clearances from the keeper and to support him from wider positions came Cristiano Ronaldo. By this time, Mourinho was beginning to show how he adapted assistance based on the players at his disposal. Javi Alonso was one of the world's best deep line playmakers. He would drop deep between the defenders. This would give the wingbacks the latitude of attacking the flanks secure on the knowledge of a back three. While Real's right fullback was relatively cautious in his build up play, Marcelo, on the other hand, was given more freedom to attack down the flanks or cut inside with the ball. From deeper positions, Marcelo could also play the deep diagonal out towards the winger on the opposite flank. His advanced positioning in attack encouraged Cristiano Ronaldo to come in from wider positions to attack the box or shoot from range. 
When Ronaldo or the left flank was closed down, the ball would rotate out to Mesut Ozil who could either create or attack the box. When the central areas of the pitch were crowded out, Real would play wider with Marcelo as a crossing outlet for Benzema and Ronaldo who would move into the box to attack the crosses. There was symmetry in the way they played because this attacking pattern was repeated out on the right flank where Angel Di Maria was comfortable going down the flanks or attacking the box. While the 4-2-3-1 was the favourite formation against teams Real expected to beat, Mourinho would use the 4-3-3 against stiffer opposition with Alonso sitting back as a deep-line playmaker behind Hedera and Diara. This allowed them to congest the centre of the pitch where they could win the ball back and launch counters from. Real defended deep and narrow much like Inter Milan but with one slight difference. During defensive transitions, Di Maria would drop and tuck inside allowing Ronaldo to stay high up the pitch. The general philosophy of Jose Mourinho remains consistent even though he has gone about it in different ways with three teams. His sides defend narrow giving up the flank so that his dominant central defenders can win the ball and initiate deadly counters. While his Chelsea side were relatively rigid, he has also shown that his sides can encompass players who are luxury playmakers cut in the mould of Mesut Ozil and Wesley Schneider who are noted for their defensive output. When Jose Mourinho got to Spurs, well, that's a different story. Uh, his tactics were very different and it's pretty apparent why he failed at Spurs. If you look at how he managed Chelsea, how he managed Inter and how he managed Real Madrid, there is a common theme in all three of them. He had a playmaker. He had somebody who could string passes together, link midfield and attack together. He had that kind of a player in all three teams. He had Frank Lampard at Chelsea, a fairly rigid team, inflexible in certain respects. He went to Milan, he had Wesley Schneider. You can call him a trequatista or an advanced playmaker. This player was very talented. There was not a lot of defensive output from him. And then we've got, of course, the king of no defensive output, Mesut Ozil at Real Madrid. But when you look at Tottenham Hotspur, Name me one player who was playing in that position and that was the problem for Spurs. Spurs also used a different formation. In fact, they had a lot of issues in the final third, creating chances. And we are not going to use Spurs as an example on today's show to tell us what's going to happen at Roma. What we're going to do is take a look at Roma. What would it take for Jose Mourinho to bring Roma to the next level? For a little experiment, we shall have to make some fundamental changes to the squad and that's exactly what we've done. So let's talk transfers now. Very simply put, Mkhitaryan is out, Lorenzo Pellegrini are out. I mean, I, I had no choice. Pellegrini didn't want to stay and uh, Bayern Munich came into 47 million. I said, why not? He would be ideal in a 4-2-3-1. He can play as a, uh, the playmaker behind the two strikers. He can play in a 4-3-3 as the set attacking midfielder that um, you know drives from the center of the pitch. He's got all the traits and the attributes for the job. Unfortunately, he doesn't want to leave. The one thing that is not in Pellegrini's toolkit is uh, the ability to score. Getting into the opposition area maybe is one, a thing that he can do, but you know, putting it into the back of the net isn't something that he can. So we are. We, I was okay with him going. I tried to sign Rodrigo de Paul, but he went to Man City instead. Ante Koric. Another player, we let him go as well. This doesn't have the aggression to play. And of course, Justin Clivert. Adding to our squad, we have several names. Now, Sebastiano Luperto was available because he was transfer listed. We need cover in the central def uh, defenders department, especially with Mancini. Mancini wants to leave. Um, Castor wants to leave. We've got a couple of fullbacks and central defenders that are unhappy. They want to leave Roma. Apparently, they don't like me. Uh, then we've got, C yes, who would have thought me signing is 30 old yet? Exactly what Mourinho does sometimes. Simeon Zaza was available and I paid 4.1 million for him. Now, he is a very strong presence in the box. I like him. I managed him in Torino and I think that he has the, he is a striker that is going to be a problem for a lot of defenses because he has decent off the ball, strength in the area. He's very good in corners, very good at set pieces. And um, yeah, he's uh, just a regular old-fashioned, annoying pressing forward. And then we've got a young Dusan Vlahovic. 
Now, I signed him because we definitely need at least three strikers in our system. So we've got him added to as well and Amin Gauri. Amin Gauri is going to be the other striker. The good thing about Amin Gauri is that while Justin Clavert has left the club, I still need some another player in case we want to swap to the 4-3-3. And then, uh, of course, yes, my playmaker, it'll be this player. He's a Macedonian, but if you look at his attributes, they're pretty solid. Now, he's got very good passing. His uh, finishing is very good. He, uh, when he gets into the box, he's going to be a danger. He's uh, going to be very, very dangerous, arriving late as well. So if I'm playing the 4-3-3, he's perfectly suited for that role, right? And he could be a very key player for us. And uh, what about the rest of the squad? Now, I haven't been able to get rid of Mr. Brian Cristiante. He's nobody, nobody wants him just yet. And, well, we'll do our best, right? He's been is the transfer status is just Milan are interested but they haven't come in with an offer yet. I'll I'll let him go for any amount of money that they want, but I still want to get one more striker, and one more DM. So the we are in the market looking for a DM and we are still looking for a striker, and another striker. So it brings my strikers to a pool of four. Going forward, we are going to be using something close to this. We are either using a Carrello here or a Mazzala. I haven't really decided yet. Uh, box to box midfielder, deep line playmaker, a very attacking 4 3 1 2 with a fullback on attack and a complete wingback on attack. Uh, we might change this to a fullback on support uh, or a complete wingback on support, depending on the opposition. If it's a weak side, we'll probably stick to this or the 4 2 3 1. And then if it's a strong side, I'm probably going to swap to this, which is the 4. Three, three. Now, here in this particular case, I might turn this into a complete forward and support. We will have somebody driving through the box. We'll have inverter wingers arriving. Uh, again, these are the rough formations that we're going to use. Common denominator in all the systems is this position, right? Okay, so uh, there's always going to be one player that ends up fairly um, active in this third, in front of zone 14. So he has to be able to Dictate play, run and control the zone pretty well. So we've got in a 4-3-3, usually it's this player. So he has to attack the space. He has to be able to move left and right. So this player literally may be told to roam from position as well. Um, he's I don't expect him to go into this pockets of space, but largely stay in this area. So we're going to have one central midfielder on attack if we were to adopt this system. Uh, if we were to adopt the 4-3-1-2, which he used uh, at Milan, then this position is generally one that has got a roaming uh, playmaker. Now, ideally, what you want to see is him controlling, again, this zone here. Um, the challenge for these kind of systems is this is probably one of the most important roles here. You could play an AP. We can play an AP. We can play a Trequatista. We can play an AMS. Now, notice one thing I kept saying, support. We don't want an attack duty. An attack, if we are going to use an attack duty, then we need the player to also come deep to get the ball, which is what he was doing uh, with the formation when he was at Roma. This was Wesley Schneider's position and he would drop in into the holes to pick uh, pick up the ball whenever any of the players in midfield were closed down. So we're going to have to find a player to play in this slot here as well. Finally, we've got the system that he used at Madrid now. Again, this role could be an AP. It could be a Trequatista. The reason why it's a Trequatista and attack is because the Trequatista is the only known role that we have that's hard-coded to drop into this position here, which is exactly what uh, Mesut Ozil was doing. He would drop as far as midfield in order for him to receive the ball and release the players in the final third. And uh, we are the key to all three systems is very simple. This position for the 4-3-3, this position for the 4-3-1-2 and this position for the 4-2-3-1. What was he playing at? Not, uh, Tottenham Hotspurs. I was about to say Nottingham Forest. He was playing something like this. And this is probably the real reason why Spurs struggle so much. They don't. They had, um, they had to have uh, Mr. Harry Kane dropping <laughs> off in midfield as well. And with the number of players that uh, he lacked 
in the final third over here. It was no wonder that Spurs had a difficult time under him. In Real Madrid, he played a 4-2-3-1 and then sometimes he played a 4-3-3. Over in the Milan, sometimes he played a 4-3-1-2, sometimes he played a 4-3-3. Now, we are definitely going to be approaching this game in that fashion. Right? This is not going to be an attempt to go and play with one tactic in an entire season. It's going to be like tough matches. We might go to the 4-3-3. Teams we can expect to hammer, we will try and get some goals and win with a 4-3-1-2. So that is the plan going forward. And I'm going to time travel into the future. The next time you watch an episode of this show, you'll find out how we've done. So please let me know in the comments below what do you think is going to happen at this club. Do you expect us to finish in the top three positions? I don't know. I don't even know where we're going to end up. But I'm still hoping to sign at least two more players. So your thoughts and I, you know, thoughts and contributions are more than welcome in the comments below. Once again, if you enjoyed this show, please hit the like and subscribe button. Stay notified for future shows. You guys stay safe, be healthy. Once again, enjoy yourselves. Bye-bye.